شهد الله أنه لا إله إلا هو والملائكة والملائكة وأولو العلم قائما بالقسط لا إله إلا هو العزيز الحكيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد أهلا وسهلا Welcome to the new book that we're going to start today inshallah after a long break um, Qaddarullahu ma sha fa'al As I said the certificates are on the table they'll be given out later on inshallah same for the sisters and also the marked papers the whole point of the exam or that test was so that the student of knowledge doesn't just come to lessons for the sake of coming like in they actually absorb and implement and understand what they're studying and the test as you as you for those of you that sat the test it was pretty simple like in there's one point that I'd like to mention on one of the questions which was why do we study knowledge you can give tons of and heaps of reasons why we study knowledge like in, if you're ever in a class especially with these classes and that sort of question comes up always refer back to that which was studied in class that which the author mentions I'll give you an example. Today's class, inshallah, as we shall see with Surah Thalatha, the Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab rahimahullah is going to say it's wajib for us to learn four issues. It is wajib for us to learn and implement four issues. Al-ilm, knowledge, acting upon it, and having patience. So he mentions these four things. So mathalan, in the, in the exam or the test, if I say to you, what are the four things that are wajib for us to learn? If you say, we have, to be, we have to learn the rights of the parents, we have to learn to pray the career of the salah correctly, and so on. And you mention four things like that. Is the answer correct or incorrect? Huh? Incorrect. Although it is right, sahih, we have to learn the rights of the parents and the, the rulings of the salah. Like in, in the book, we did not study that. And the whole point of that is that you know what's in the book. So now, for example, you know that you've studied Khulasa in the, the previous book. Now that you've studied it in the Muqaddimah, in the second point, not the Muqaddimah, in the second point, there were four reasons why we study knowledge. Now there are more reasons why we study knowledge. Like in these four were the ones that were mentioned in the book. Of the author Sheikh Salih al Asim, and he he cited it from or mentioned it from the words of Imam Ahmed rahimahullah Taala. That's just um, something that I wanted to bring to your attention. طيب. as you know, so firstly, this class, inshallah, hopefully, we're going to talk about slightly a muqaddimah, obviously, on to why we study aqidah, a short biography of Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab, uh, look into the kitab itself, how it's divided, and so on, and then. We'll start with the book Bidnillah Ta'ala. So the first or before we get into the first, how can you take advantage of the sharh that you're learning? Firstly, you have to read the book beforehand. So today you're probably gonna or probably probably gonna study these four issues that I just mentioned. So what you should have done already is what? Hmm? You should have read at least the first introduction or the first part that Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab mentions طيب, where did we study that خلاص تعليم العلم صح that's where we studied it خلاص تعليم العلم so now from this point onwards inshallah the books that we're going to study implement what you studied in خلاص تعليم العلم implement what you studied in خلاص تعليم العلم and the very first thing that you can implement is even before the class, you have a quick glance, 
quick glance at what is to come or what you're going to study today. What's the benefit of that? When you come to the class, you're not in no man's land. You know what the, uh, the teacher is talking about. You know what to expect. You have a quick or a rough idea of what the teacher is going to talk about and what the author mentions. So when you've looked at it beforehand, you attend class. And then in class, you're able to absorb more because you know what's coming. طيب. So that's two times that you've reviewed the book. Before class, during class. Then when you go home, you're going to study it on your own, inshallah. You're going to look at your notes and you're going to understand or you're going to try to understand all of the issues that were mentioned. طيب. Then fourthly, you review what you've studied or your notes and what you've understood from the class with your peers, with your brothers and sisters, with those that you are close with to revise the book. How many times is that you've reviewed it? Four times. And then inshallah before the test, you're going to review it again. That's five times. I guarantee you if you review knowledge in this way, using this method, everything that you study will stay with you. You'll memorize it and understand it like the Fatiha. And that's the whole point of seeking knowledge. طيب. The next th- uh, advice on um, taking notes. When you're taking notes, it's impossible for you to write everything that I'm about to say. What In any teacher, it's impossible for you to write everything that the teacher will say. Because you're either writing... Or you're either listening. Like in what you do is, for example, the first topic we're going to study is the importance of aqidah. So you write that title. Then I'm going to say one, two, three, four. I'm going to mention four or five issues. When I mention the first issue, write it down as it is, a subtitle. And then listen. And then understand. Don't write everything, for example, point one. Just write about four or five lines, four or five words that will help you understand what the teacher is saying. And then listen. Don't write everything that the teacher is saying for point number one. Then move over to point number two. Same thing. Just notes. Just write the subtitles. Later on, later on, you will remember what the teacher was talking about. For example, if the teacher mentions a verse... Just write the beginning of the verse. If the teacher mentions a hadith, write a part of the hadith. Don't mention, don't write the whole hadith. Just write these two words. Or actions are according to their intentions. And write hadith at the end. Al hadith, meaning the hadith. The rest of the verse. طيب. That's with regards to taking the notes Then If you're able to listen to the recording again Listen to it again That will benefit you Because it's like you're attending the class Two times You're attending the class two times You're listening You're in class And secondly you're listening to it afterwards And also make your own summary Do your own summary if you look into the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah, almost every single one of them has his own explanation of this book. Yes, it's more often than not, pretty much 60 or 70% of it is the same. Like, in where do these explanations come from? The fact that they've taught it. And then they review it and they write it down and fix it and put the ayat in the certain places and the hadith in certain places. So do your own summary. And that's one of the ways that a student can become well-grounded. Where they summarize what they've learnt, what they've understood from the class. Why am I stressing these points? Because you don't want to be attending classes for three, four, five years, and at the end of the at the end of the day, you don't have anything to show for it. And it's happened. We see it all the time. S- people who have been attending classes for years. Every lecture, they're, they're there. Lakin, if you were to ask them a simple question, they won't be able to answer it. 
it's not because they're dumb, no. It's not because they can't understand that. It's just because the manhajiyya, the dariqa, the methodology that they're using, the methodology that they're taking in Sikh knowledge is incorrect. And we studied this in Khulasa Ta'adim al Alim. The first point we're going to talk about today is Ahmiyatul Aqeedah. The importance of studying Aqeedah and correcting the Aqeedah. The importance of correcting our Aqeedah. First and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first point is that Allah jalla wa ala created us for his ibadah, that we worship him. Allah jalla wa ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created the ins and jinn except that they worship me. So the fact that we've been created for worship, that's the heart of the aqeedah, performing ibadah. And ibadah won't be accepted from the servant unless it meets two conditions. The first condition is that it has to be in accordance, it has to be upon ikhlas. It has to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the evidence for that is the hadith of Umar radiallahu anhu where he said uh, where the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said where the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said innama al-a'malu bin-niyat al-hadith to the end of the hadith verily actions are judged according to their intentions so if a person does an action and it's not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what comes in? A shirk. The person falls into what? A shirk. Associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's when aqeedah comes in. Because shirk harms the aqeedah of the Muslim. And it takes the person out of Islam. Secondly, the second condition for ibadah to be accepted is that it has to be in accordance with the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the evidence for that is the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fa huwa ghad Whoever introduces into this affair of ours, meaning this religion That which is not from it, then it is rejected from him The hadith of Aisha, narrated by Bukhari and Muslim Rahimahumullah So if it's not in accordance the ibadah that we're doing, if it's not in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did that specific ibadah, then the person falls into a bid'ah. A person falls into a bid'ah. And again, bid'ah harms the aqeedah of a Muslim, the belief of a Muslim. Because it makes it takes him from the sunnah to the bid'ah. It takes him out of the fold of Ahl Sunnah. So with these two points, we know that your ibadah is not accepted except with the correct aqeedah. And no action will be accepted except with it being meeting these two conditions. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, referring to the kuffar, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا Allah Jalla wa Ala in Surah Al-Furqan mentions that the actions of the kuffar will be brought forward لكن it will be like dust floating particles of dust meaning it's nothing note that Allah says وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ they did actions it's not like they did not do actions and even amongst the kuffar you see so many of them paying charity even leaving their inheritance uh, in foundations and so on, with foundations. Like in their actions will not be accepted because it doesn't meet the condition of the ibadah. The second point showing the importance of aqeedah and rectifying the aqeedah is the fact that it is the call of all of the anbiya. Every single messenger 
from the time of Nuh alayhi salam to the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam called his people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ya qawmi abudullaha ma lakum min ilahin ghayru Oh my people worship Allah jalla wa ala you do not have any ilah or rabb or gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah jalla wa ala says wa laqad ba'athna fi kulli ummatin rasulan an i'budullaha wa tajtanibu at-ta'ut Allah jalla wa ala sent every single messenger calling with a message or with a message أن يعبد الله واجتنب الطاغوت Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay away from ضاغوت Everything that is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Now that shows that every prophet came with the same da'wah and they were calling their people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Also the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a messenger for 23 years for the beginning of his Prophethood sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He spent 13 years In Mecca Calling the people to Tawheed Rectifying the aqeedah aqeed and iman of the Muslims That's why if you look into the Quran It is divided into Makki and Madani Verse and surahs that were re- revealed in Mecca During the time of Mecca and verses that were revealed during the time of Medina. And the cut-off period is the hijrah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you look into the verses that were revealed in Mecca, they're concentrating on instilling, embedding al aqidah the correct aqidah into the Muslims. Warning them against shirk. Warning them against disobeying Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Warning them against... Uh, worshipping graves and other uh, false gods besides Allah Jalla wa ala. And also following the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and fearing what's to come, Yawm al Qiyamah and in the grave and so on. Whereas if you look at the Quran that was revealed in Medina, a lot of it is to do with the Ahkam, the Islamic jurisprudence, Zakah, Jihad, Hajj, fasting, zak- uh, and so on. So that shows the importance of Al-Aqeedah. Also, point number three, what shows the importance of Aqeedah is that Muslims will not be honorable and there's no power with the Muslims and no honor except with rectifying the Aqeedah of the Muslims. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَيُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِي اقْتَضَى لَهُمْ وَلَيُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنًا يَعْبُدُونَنِي لَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِي شَيْئًا Allah Jalla wa Ala says that he has promised those that believe and come with righteous actions do righteous actions like he has promised that he will give them succession and authority and who will change their fear to security. Allah Jalla wa Ala will give them succession on the earth. Give them authority and power and might. And he will change Jalla wa Ala their fear to safety and security. Like in what is the condition? يَعْبُدُونَنِي لَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِشَيْئًا That they worship me alone. And that they do not associate partners with me. These are the two conditions that Allah Jalla wa Ala mentioned. That we worship Allah Jalla wa Ala alone and we do not associate partners with him. That's why when we look into the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's biography, after, the, after he established uh, the Muslims in Medina, they were beforehand kicked out of Mecca. They were chased out and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a deadly journey from Mecca to Medina where he spent 12 to 13 days. Him and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam running from Quraysh and Quraysh chasing them. Lakin after a few years the Muslims walked into Mecca 
And there was no fighting. They walked into Mecca, the same city that they were kicked out of. The same place that they were kicked out of. And there, many of them had to leave their families and their wealth and they were tortured and so on. Like in that was because of the honor of Tawheed and Sunnah. The honor of Islam. That's why Umar said, radiallahu anhu, نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ أَعَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ we are a people who have been given might and honored with Al Islam. And this is the only way that the Muslims can regain their honor. And if you ever see Muslims being degraded and demeaned and degraded, the reason is because they've left off their religion. The Messenger وسلم, said in authentic hadith. إذا تبايعتم بالعينة وأخذتم بأذناب البقر وتركتم الجهاد سلط الله عليكم ذلا لا ينزعه حتى ترجعوا إلى دينكم أوثنتك حديث نويت بإمام أبي داود من حديث عبد الله بن عمر If you indulge in usury, riba and you hold on to the tails of cam- the, 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 the cattle and you indulge and you busy yourselves with agriculture and you leave off jihad then Allah Jalla wa'ala will cause you to be degraded and that will prevail and it will not be removed until you return to your religion and up until you return to your religion it won't be or this will be the case like and if you return back to your religion and the correct teachings of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then you will gain honor and no one will be able to defeat you. So when you see people saying um, the reason why the Muslims are backwards is because they know they're behind in technology or they don't have money or they don't have land that's incorrect. We have money, we have technology and all of these things lacking the reason why we're like this is because we've left off the teachings of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam طيب also number 4 and the last point that rectifying the aqidah is what distinguishes ahl sunnah wal jama'a from other deviant sects You will find Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah in their da'wah. The very first thing they start off with is calling to the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Calling to the Sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when they're teaching, they're teaching the books of Aqeedah. And they warn against shirk. They call to Tawheed on the members in lessons and in every single gathering. And they call to the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the member and in their lessons and every other, ga- every other gathering. And when the people leave off Tawheed, they call to Tawheed. So for example, you will find that you can easily distinguish between a khatib, a person who's the, the person that's given the fire sermon, whether he's upon the sunnah or not. Mathalan, you will find that when these kuffar are celebrating Christmas, the khatib from Ahlul Sunnah will talk about the falseness of, of Christmas and that shirk is unaccepted or is unacceptable. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ عَنْ يُشْرِكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ And they will call to worship in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and they will warn the people against celebrating Christmas. And the same goes for New Year's Eve. They warn the people against celebrating these events that allow them to resemble the kuffar. Lakin if you go to the masajid of the Ikhwan al-Muslimin, when you listen to their khutbas, they're talking about what's your plan for next year, what you're going to do, let's have high aspirations and so on for the coming year, what's your New Year's resolution? 
And when it comes to Christmas, they're talking about other issues, which may be important. Like in, they're not as important as warning against shirk when shirk is coming, when shirk is being practiced by Muslims or people that have left Islam because of shirk. When Muslims are resembling the kuffar, it's not befitting for you to be talking about what their goals are for the coming year. Also, you will find the people of Ahlul Sunnah, when people are celebrating the birthday of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, they're on the mimba warning against the celebrating of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam's birthday. Whereas the people of innovation, they will start talking about the importance of understanding the biography of the Messenger. Yani those that are not celebrating it, even though they're not celebrating it, they'll say that it's important that we read the biography of the Prophet وسلم, and we revive his sunnah and so on. In a way that the listener will think that this person is justifying celebrating the birthday of the Prophet وسلم, and then they will tell you there's khilaf and some of the, and they'll name you uh, some scholars who said that it's okay to celebrate and so on. Like in they won't remember the hadith of the messenger that we read earlier on. Whoever does an action not from our actions, then it is rejected. They won't read these. Also, you will find, مثلا, Ikhwan Muslimin, they don't start with that calling to Tawheed, rectifying Tawheed. They will call to rebelling against the Hukam. And they will say, if we can remove that Hakim, then everything else will be good. And the people will be shuyukhul Islam. Everyone will be a shaykh and mashallah, the masjids will be packed. And people will stop committing ma'asi and sins and, and shirk and bid'ah. So you won't find them calling to, to tawheed. The biggest evidence is, if we look into where the da'wah of Ikhwan Muslimin started, originated from Egypt, what have Ikhwan Muslimun done for the Muslim da'wah in Egypt? There are graves that are being worshipped. Many graves being worshipped. People are committing shirk. People are committing bid'ah. Have Ikhwan Muslimun, have they tried to rectify this problem? La. And then they go far and beyond to other countries. Now your da'wah can only be successful if it is successful in the place that it originated from. And I'll give you a practical example. If I have an idea and I want to do something and I say to you, Dai, Mr. Mathal, in this masjid, let's build it. It's my masjid or I'm the one that came up with the idea and I'm going to do the fundraising but I want your help. Common sense will tell you that I first have to strive. Sah? I have to strive. I have to get a plan in, pro, uh, in place. I have to bring a plan into place. I have to say to you, we want to do this and this and this and that. Once I show some commitment, then you'll show commitment. But if I don't show any commitment, will you have any commitment? More often than not, no. So you can't take your da'wah to another place when in reality your own back, backyard is on fire People are worshipping idols People are worshipping graves in your own backyard People are calling upon other than Allah Jalla wa Ala Calling upon Hussein and Ali and so on And people are celebrating the birthday of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And in these gatherings they're calling upon other than Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Rectify that before you rectify anything else Also another practical example Look at Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab Who we shall talk about inshallah Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab started off his da'wah in the Arabian Peninsula. Look what he changed the Arabian Peninsula to. To a land of Tawheed, a place of Tawheed. Where there were, where there were no idols being worshipped after the Sheikh, after the Sheikh's da'wah became prominent. Like in beforehand, it was a place that people used to Tons of graves It was like every single corner Just like we have corner shops There was a grave in every corner And people were making dawah after them Asking them Ya madad and so on And then you have other jama'at Who also call to Going from one place to one place Doing dawah around the earth Like jama'at at tabliq 
and they will call to Tawheed. But they'll call to Tawheed al Rububiya. They won't call to Tawheed al Uluhiya. That's if they call to Tawheed al Rububiya. But if they do call to Tawheed, it's Tawheed al Rububiya. Meaning they'll say, Allah is the creator, Allah is the sustainer. Sahih, Allah is the creator, Allah is the sustainer. But Abu Jahl didn't have any issue with that. If, if Prophet Muhammad came to Quraysh and he said to them, Listen, guys, Allah is the creator. Allah is the one that provides rain. Allah is the one that sustains. Allah is the one that gave us health and so on. They say, Well, that's here, Muhammad. You're right. That's what they would have said to him. There would have been no issue. Like, when did the problem appear or occur between Muhammad, our Messenger وسلم, and Quraysh? When did it occur? When he said, Ya Qawm, Ulu la ilaha illallah, Tuflihu. My people say, La ilaha illallah, you will be successful. So once you say la ilaha illallah, you will be successful. They were Arab. They were Aqhah. They were pure Arabs. They knew what la ilaha illallah meant. They knew that if you say la ilaha illallah, you can't worship Hubal and all of these other la tul uzza. All of these other gods. False gods. That's why they rejected the call of the Messenger Sallallahu Wasallam. Has he made the gods one god? So if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have accepted or would have came to Quraysh with da'wah to uh, call into Tawheed al only, Wallahi, they would have been so happy. They would have welcomed him with open arms. Like in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُ مَا تَعْبُدُونَ I will not worship that which you worship. طيب and it's not something I'm making up. Every one of us has probably got a local masjid that they come to. And then they always say our certainty and our success is based on so, you know, the usual line that you always hear. Like when it comes to the da'wah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they start off with calling and rectifying the tawheed of the Muslims, the aqeedah of the Muslims. If you have the aqeedah on firm ground and it's firm and it is solid, Everything else will fall into place. Because what's after that? It's what? Fiqh issues, huh? Fiqh issues, there's a lot of khilaf in. We refer back to the evidence. Like, and even if you make a mistake in, in fiqh issues, you may not be held to account. If you have a khilaf and you genuinely believe that this opinion is stronger than this opinion and you have your evidence, then you won't be held to account. You'll be rewarded for that. As long as you done, uh, as long as you do the correct ijtihad. Tayyib. That's the first part, which is what? What was that topic? The importance of studying aqidah and rectifying aqidah. There's three terminologies that I want you to write down. Number one, a tawheed. A tawheed. Number two, al aqidah. And number three, al manhaj. Now, this is just terminologies that will help you understand some of the books of Ahlul Ilm when you read them and some of the lectures and so on. طيب. Number one was what? A tawheed, sah? A tawheed ifradullahi bima yakhtassu bihi. Singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that which is specific to him. So, مثلاً, Tawheed, that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Tawheed al That is Tawheed. It is the connection that the servant has with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing that Allah created him. Knowing the beautiful names of Allah jalla wa ala and worshipping Allah, even when he's making dua, using the names, beautiful names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the Tawheed is the connection that the Muslim has with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in specifying that which is specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. طيب. Then you have aqeedah. And the aqeedah is 
ما يعتقده الإنسان اعتقادا جازما that which the insan believes in that which you believe in that has been narrated in the Quran and the Sunnah that has been narrated that which has been narrated in the Quran and the Sunnah having firm belief firm conviction firm firm belief of that which Allah Jalla wa'ala and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah مثلا to believe ما يعتقده الإنسان اعتقادا جازما مما جاء في الشرع مما جاء في الشرع so مثلا that you believe in Allah the six pillars of Iman مثلا that you believe in Allah that you believe in the angels you believe in the messengers you believe in the last day you believe in the قبر you believe in the قدر these are things that we believe in the aqeedah also, the fact that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the best of the creation. The fact that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the best of the messengers. The fact that the companions are the most noble people after the messengers of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That we love the angels. Afan, that we love every single companion. That we honor them, that we respect them and so on. That we do not rebel against the hukam. That we do not commit bid'ah. All of that is what a person believes in. It is the i'tiqad. And it is slightly more comprehensive than the tawheed. So for example, if you're reading Kitab al-Tawheed, more often than not, Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab rahimahullah will talk about the connection, that Allah Jalla wa ala, the connection between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his servants. That they worship him alone. But if you look into the books of Aqeedah in more general, the Mathal and Usul Sunnah, there are almost 50 Masail issues that are mentioned by Imam, Imam Ahmad Rahimahullah and Aqeedah Tarazi and all of the other books of the Aqeedah or of Ahl Sunnah. They talk about things that we believe in. So the Aqeedah is slightly more comprehensive than what? Tawheed. And the last, the last terminology was what? Manhaj. Manhaj is more comprehensive than Aqeedah as well. So Manhaj is not only what you believe in, not only the fact that you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, but all of your other dealings and mu'amalat and day-to-day actions, how you deal with your parents, how, do, how you deal with your uh, friends and family and so on, how you deal with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how you understand the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is slightly more comprehensive than Aqeedah. It could be, no. How the previous two are implemented and understood. It could be. But obviously it is more general. Even respecting people and dealing with people in a good way, we follow the manhaj of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The next point is, oh, the first point, Aqeedah. We mentioned how many points? Who can summarize them? Number one, why do we study Aqeedah? Why is it important to correct the Aqeedah of the Muslim? Uh, because we are critical of Ibadah, and so Ibadah will not be accepted unless it falls into the correct, if it doesn't have class or uh, it was a son of the Prophet. Like Excellent. So your, our Ibadah will not be accepted Unless it meets the sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, and it's for the sake of Allah. That goes back to Aqeedah. Number two. Uh, hmm? is the da'wah, it was calling to the Tawheed of Allah Jalla wa ala, and rectifying the belief is the call of every single Messenger. Right? No honor until you rectify the Aqeedah. Excellent. There's no honor for this Ummah, and no power, and no might, unless. Their aqeedah is rectified, or unless its aqeedah is rectified. Number four. Excellent. Every single deviant group will call to that which they want. 
مثلا المعتزله they call to tawhid as well they have five principles they call to tawhid لكن what is tawhid according to them negating the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala لكن according to Ahl al-Sunnah according to tawhid is exactly what the messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم did طيب since you had your hand up what was the last thing that we talked about And you asked the question on it. Oh. Three terminologies. Tawheed, oh, uh, Aqeedah, and Manhaj. Which is the most comprehensive? Manhaj, then? Aqeedah, then? Tawheed. The next point we're going to go to is the, a brief tarjama of the biography of Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab. And it's going to be brief because, inshallah, hopefully, there'll be a lecture somewhere along the line on Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab and his da'wah and what distinguishes his da'wah from other da'wahs and so on. And the reason this is extremely important is because now you find a lot of comedians mocking and lying about Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab and saying he's a takfiri and saying he is Daesh. Now I'm not talking about these comedians in social media because they're not worth the time. Lacking. There are people who actually author books saying that the da'wah of Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab is the da'wah of Daesh or ISIS. So we have to be able to differentiate between that and it is wajib for us to defend those who aided this religion. So his name rahimahullah ta'ala, is Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab ibn Sulaiman ibn Ali ibn Muhammad ibn Ahmed al-Wahbi al-Tamimi. He was from the tribe of a Tamim. Rahimahullahu Ta'ala Rahmatun Wasi'a. He was born the year 1115 after the Hijrah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was born, or he was from a family, he was from a, a religious family and a knowledgeable family. So his father, his grandfather, his uncles, paternal uncles, maternal uncles, they were all qudat and judges and they were prolific in their Hanbali madhab. So he was born into a family of scholars. So it's only befitting and understandable that he becomes an imam from the imams of the sunnah. He memorized the Quran before reaching the age of 10 and he learnt or studied under his, fa- parent, his father, his grandfather and the other scholars that were around his location, in his area, in the land that he resided in. And we take from there a benefit, which is that a lot of people, they apply to certain, the Islamic universities in al Medina or Riyadh and so on, or they inquire about going to those places of Ahl Sunnah in Yemen and so on and in Egypt, so they want to travel, which is good. May Allah Jalla wa'ala give them tawfiq. But when it comes to attending classes in the land that they're in, in the location that they're in, you find them not attending. So they will, it's like they're saying, I'm going to start seeking knowledge when I get there. Like, and this is incorrect. A person must first seek knowledge where he is. So Shaykh Muhammad Abdul Wahab, rahmatullahi alayhi, at a young age, he studied and you'll find that with many scholars. All of the scholars of hadith, before traveling, they will learn that which was under their disposal or at their disposal, which was the scholars in their land or the teachers in their land. And alhamdulillah, in the UK, we're blessed. Better, when, يعني, we have a, a, a great advantage over those people that live in other parts of Europe or in America and so on. Alhamdulillah, there are many, many students of knowledge from Ahlul Sunnah who are all teaching beneficial books. May Allah Jalla wa ala preserve every single one of them. Amen. And they're everywhere. East London, North London, South London, West London. Everywhere you find, alhamdulillah, students of Ahl sunnah So we should benefit from them. May Allah preserve them. Amen. Then the Shaykh, rahimahullah ta'ala, he traveled to Al-Hijaz, Mecca and Medina, and he sought knowledge in Mecca and then Medina. And he learned a lot of had questions after, inshallah. Write them down. And he... Uh, sought knowledge under the scholars that were there then he came back to his land and he stayed there for quite a bit and then he travelled back to Iraq Basra and so on 
in order to seek knowledge and he tried to go to Sham, Syria and Damascus lacking he wasn't able to due to financial reasons Lakin he came back to an area called a place called Ahsa and he sought knowledge there again and then he went back to where he was originally from Huraymala he gave wanted to give da'wah start to give da'wah Lakin he wasn't welcomed then he moved to Dir'iya Afran Unayza Uyayna and he wasn't welcome and he had to go again and he went to Dir'iya and that's where he met the Imam Muhammad bin Saud and that's where his da'wah was welcome and that's where he started his call and his da'wah is what you see today as Saudi Arabia where after 300 years the blessings of his da'wah are still apparent now in the land of Saudi Arabia ta'ala, and it's not for political gain like you won't find a single graveyard that people are worshipping graves you won't find a single tomb even when you go to the qabr, the grave of Sheikh Muhammad and Abdul Wahab himself it's like every other grave you won't be able to distinguish it why? because it is a land of Tawheed and it goes back to the da'wah of Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab. And the da'wah of Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah ta'ala, goes back to the da'wah of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the salafu as salih. Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he's got many books. One of the first books he authored was Kitab al-Tawheed. He's got Usul al-Thalatha that we have here, Al-Qawa'id al-Akba' al nawaqid al-Islam, Usul al-Sitta, Kashi Shubuhat, uh, and many other books and in many different sciences not only in Aqeedah although his takhasus or his specialty was Aqeedah like he has other books and if you f- look into any of his books you will find that his words are, minor, are, are, are a minimum it's more often than not he's always saying قال الله وقال رسول Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said and the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said and the salaf said and we're seeing it now in this verse, in this book that we're about to study now. Also, write down a subtitle Reasons for the Success of the Da'wah of Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab. Why was his Da'wah successful? Firstly, because he called to the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He called to the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was the Tawheed of the Anbiya. So he took the same path as our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in da'wah. And the same path as the Salaf al-Salih. Therefore, his da'wah was successful, just like the da'wah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Salaf was successful. And we see from that a benefit, which is that if you call to the way of Allah jalla wa ala, Exactly how the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam did, then your da'wah will be successful. Like if you call to uh, doing tawaf and saying khuruj and let's go from here to here, and if you call to a way other than the way of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, your da'wah can be a hundred years old. Lakin, it will have no fruit. It will have no fruit and it will be of no benefit. Also, the second thing that helps Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab is his da'wah was actually upon knowledge. He was a alim. He sought knowledge. He was a person upon knowledge. And that is also a reputation against these groups who say we're going to call to Allah upon ignorance. So they take a person from the street, from wherever he was, and then they say give da'wah. So their da'wah will not be successful. Also, Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab's da'wah was based upon the Qur'an and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf. The Qur'an and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf. And if a person has these three, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will aid him. Mathalan, many of you have heard of Sheikh Muqbil ibn Hadi al Wadi, Rahmatullah alayhi rahmatullah, the great scholar of Yemen. When he went to Yemen, when he went back to Yemen, there were a lot of Rawafid, a lot of Shia there. 
Zaydiyya and a lot of deviant groups. And he started his da'wah. Lakin he started his da'wah based on the Quran of Allah, the Kitab of Allah, the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam upon the understanding of the Salaf al-Salih, these three. The Quran and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf al-Salih. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aided his da'wah and made his da'wah successful. To the extent now that in many parts of the world, in many parts of the world, those that are scholars now and ulama and those that are giving da'wah and those that are calling to uh, the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are from the students of Shaykh Muqbil ibn Hadi rahmatullahi alayhi wa rahmatullahi wa So that is a practical contemporary example that if a person calls to the Qur'an and the Sunnah upon the understanding of the Salaf and Allah decrees, then his da'wah shall be successful. Also, from the things that made his da'wah successful is that he built it upon hujjah. He used to build his da'wah upon evidence. So there's not a single masala he mentions except that he gives an evidence for it from the Qur'an. So, مثلاً, masala and dalil, masala and dalil. So these four things that he's going to mention now, he's going to bring you evidence. Every masala he brings, every issue that he mentions, he brings an evidence. And when you give someone evidence, they're more likely to accept your da'wah. Like if you say to someone, oh, I heard people saying this, you know, you have to do this. They won't take your da'wah. They won't even listen to you. Like if you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the, the ijma' of the salaf is this, the consensus of the salaf is this. If he's a person who wants goodness, then they will accept the words of Allah and the words of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The third point before starting the book is a simple introduction into the book. And write this down. And why is it important to know the book that you're studying and have an overview of the book that you're studying so that you don't get lost? So that you don't th- you're not lost midway through the book. So that you know what's to come. So this book, Usul al is from those books that the scholars always start off with. Why? Because as we started off with, as we studied in Khulas Ta'adim al-Ilm, the previous book, when you're studying knowledge, you should study it how? Darajat, Tadaguj. Bit by bit. You take the small knowledge before the bigger knowledge. And this book is very concise. Lakin is great in terms of meaning. <coughs> and the scholars always start off with it. Also, its wording is easy. Its wording is easy. Also, it's based upon the three questions that the Muslim will be uh, the person will be asked in the grave. Man Rabbuk, Madinuk, Waman Nabiyuk. Who is your Lord? What is your religion? And who was your Prophet? So we learn this book. So that we're able to answer these questions in the grave. So that it will benefit us in the grave. طيب. So the book starts off, or the sheikh starts off with an introduction. Then the three usul, the, found, the three foundations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the religion of Allah, Islam, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then it has a khatima. So firstly, he talks about four issues. Four Issues, knowledge, acting upon it, calling to it, and so on. Then he's going to talk about number two, three masail, three issues to do with tawheed and to do with loving and hating for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, he, in a page or two, he talks about the importance of why we study these three. Why we have to study these three foundations? That's number three, sah? The third part. The fourth part is the actual usul. The actual usul. So he teaches us about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who Allah jalla wa ala is. And then he talks about Islam, what it is, and what Islam is, what iman is, what ihsan is. And then he talks about the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. Then... The Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where he was born, where he migrated to, and so on. 
after finishing that, the fifth point is that he finishes off with a khatima, an ending, which talks about general things being raised the Omla Qiyamah and so on. And then that's how he ends the book. Who can summarize that? Number one. Learn four things that we must learn. They, someone else. Then the second part. Three issues to do with Tawheed and oath and allegiance. Al Wala wal Baga. Excellent. The three the importance of Tawheed and why we study Tawheed and why it's important to know these. That's three. Excellent. The actual three fundamentals. And number four or five. Khatima, different issues where he rounds off the book with play. As expected, we're going to do an exam, inshallah. We're going to do an exam. Whether we do it at the end of the book or whether we do it halfway through, we'll, we'll see, inshallah. Tayyip. So, Sheikh Muhammad is going to read, sir. Sheikh Muhammad, Muhammad, sir. Muhammad. Sheikh Muhammad is going to read. <coughs> and before starting, write the tarikh, write the date on the right hand side of your book, inshallah. So it's the 17th of Jumad Athani. The year 1443 after the Hijrah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 1443 after the Hijrah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which coincides with the 21st of January. 2022 and Muslims should try using the Hijri calendar as much as they can as much as they can I can there's no harm if you use uh, the other calendar if you need to it's Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Allahumma hafad shaykhna, wa ghfir lahu, wa li walidayhi, wa li mashayikhihi, wa li jami'a al-muslimin. Allahumma amin. Al-usul thalathatu wa adillatuha li imam al-da'wati al-shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab ibn Suleyman al-Tamimi. قال المصنف رحمه الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اعلم رحمك الله أنه يجب علينا تعلم أربع مسائل الأولى العلم وهو معرفة الله ومعرفة نبيه ومعرفة دين الإسلام بالأدلة الثاني العمل به الثالث الدعوة إليه الرابع الصبر على الأذى فيه والدليل قوله تعالى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر قال الشافعي رحمه الله تعالى لو ما أنزل الله حجة على خلقه إلا هذه السورة لكفتهم وقال البخاري رحمه الله تعالى باب العلم قبل القول والعمل والدليل قوله تعالى فاعلم أنه لا إله إلا الله واستغفر لذنبك فبدأ بالعلم قبل القول والعمل طيب so بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم The Sheikh starts with the Basmala which contains three of the beautiful names and attributes of Allah سبحانه وتعالى Allah, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim So the first question is why did the Sheikh start off with the Basmala and the Sheikh does this in a lot of his books and a lot of other scholars also start there, works with the Bismillah. The first reason is that it, he's copying the Qur'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the Qur'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Every single surah, apart from Bara'a, starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Number two, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would always start his correspondence with other kings and leaders and so on with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Also, the Salaf al-Salih, they would also do the same. 
when they're starting their books, they will start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Also, number four, the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala is seeking the aid and the blessings of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So by you starting in the name of Allah, you're asking Allah for isti'ana. You're asking Allah to aid you and help you in accomplishing this thing that you're about to do. So if you say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, before reading a book, it's like you saying, Oh Allah, give me the ability and bless me in my reading and uh, give me the ability to finish this book. If you're eating, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings in that which you're eating. If you're going to a certain place and you say Bismillah, then you're seeking the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the barakah of Allah and the help of Allah in accomplishing that thing that you're about to do. Tayyip. I'lam, rahimakallah. So the Sheikh says, I'lam. I'lam means no. Lakin, the scholars mention this when they're trying to get their, trying to get your attention. I'lam. And if you see I'lam, it shows that what's coming after, what comes after I'lam is extremely important. So you must take heed and you must ponder and concentrate. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, Fa'lam. What comes after fa'lam? When Allah Jalla wa Ala says in Surah Muhammad, fa'lam, what comes after it? <laughs> La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Being the most important thing that is in the life of a Muslim. The most important thing in our lives is La ilaha illallah. Our tawheed of Allah Jalla wa Ala and us singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ibadah is the most important thing that we have in our lives. That's why Allah says fa'lam, no. Anahu La ilaha illallah. That there's none that has the right to be worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So have knowledge of. Tayyip. Rahimakallah. Annahu yajibu alayna. The Shaykh says, Rahimakallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you. We take from this word a few things. Number one, that when you're giving da'wah, that you have to be gentle. When you're given da'wah, whether it's in the khutbah, in a lesson, in a lecture, or you're advising someone, we have to be gentle. Because knowledge is based upon gentleness. Knowledge is based upon gentleness. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ar-Rahimuna yarhamuhum ar-Rahman. Irhamu man fil ard, irhamukum man fil sama. Those that have mercy, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have, will have mercy upon them. And especially more so when giving da'wah. When you are giving da'wah and you're gentle to people and you're respecting people and you're not insulting their intelligence, more often than not they will accept your da'wah and agree with you. Even if they don't agree with you in terms of evidence, like in they will respect your opinion. And they will be more accepting to leaving off their opinion. So when you're giving da'wah, you have to be gentle. The Messenger وسلم, said, مَا كَانَ رِفْقُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَانَ Gentleness is not put into something except that it beautifies it. And it is not taken out of something إِلَّا شَانَ Except that it makes it ugly. So gentleness or knowledge is based upon gentleness. And when we're giving da'wah, we have to have mercy upon people. And we have to know that we're giving da'wah not so that they follow us, like in that they follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger, the haqq. They follow the truth. If you look into the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith where the, the Bedouin came into the masjid and he urinated in the corner of the masjid, the companions went towards him, rushed towards him to stop him, like in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prevented them from doing so. And then he went, when the, allowed him to finish, and then he came, went to him and he said, these are the houses of Allah, they're for the tasbih and the tazkir, the remembrance of Allah, and the prayer of Allah, and they're not for what you've just done. What did the man say? May Allah have mercy upon you, me, and no one else. Why? Because of the way the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, dealt with him. Tayyip. Also, we take from here, who is saying, I'lam rahimakallah? Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab. 
it shows the mercy that he has for the people that he's calling. Whether it's the people that were around his time or those that come after him reading his book. He's making dua for them. So we see that the Sheikh is gentle. Therefore we, or that refutes those people that say Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab used to kill innocent people. Ya akhi, even in his book, even when teaching people, he's saying, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you. A person that's making dua for the person that he's giving da'wah to, can you imagine him killing innocent people? La, rather than saying, rahimakallah, according to them, he should have said, I'lam qatalakallah. No, may Allah kill you, destroy you. Lakin <laughs> he says, Rahimakallah, may Allah have mercy upon you. If he's this merciful, Rahimahullah ta'ala, in his works and writings, can you imagine how he was in person? Rahimahullah ta'ala, rahmatan wasi'ah. Like in those people that say he kills innocent people, they're obviously ignorant people that don't know the da'wah of Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab, that want to indulge in books that were written against Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab. And those that hate the da'wah of Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab, meaning what he called to, which was the Tawheed of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa made du'a for Abdullah ibn Abbas when he was giving him da'wah, when he was teaching him, Allahumma faqihhu fi din Oh Allah, give him understanding of the religion. Wa'allimhu ta'wil. And teach him the interpretation of the Qur'an. So gentleness is extremely important when giving da'wah. And I'm stressing this because a lot of times people say, why are those people that practice him? Why are they always harsh? They think they're better than everyone else. It's a reality. Obviously, we're not going to say it to everyone else. Luckily, it's a reality though. A lot, of, a lot of people, they think that once you start practicing, that you're better than everyone else. As long as I've got my hijab on or my thawb on, then I'm, be- I'm better than, and I pray in the masjid, I'm better than all of those people that are not in the masjid and so on. And this is incorrect. And some of them, some of our brothers, just because they've attended a few classes and they've understood what Salafi means, they start to say we're the only Salafis and no one else is Salafi. Again, this is not good because you're meant to have mercy upon everyone and call everyone to the Haqq. You're not meant to praise yourself. Rahimakallah. No, may Allah have mercy upon you that it is wajib upon us to have or to understand and to know four things, to have knowledge of. The first point is yajib. Where the shaykh says wajib, or it's obligatory upon us, underline it. And there are three issues we want to study there. First and foremost, what is a wajib? A wajib is مَا يُعَاقَبُ تَارِكُهُ وَيُثَابُ فَاعِلُهُ امْتِثَالًا لِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ That which if you do, you will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you leave it off, you will be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tariquhu. Or write the other one first. Ma yuthabu fa'iluhu. The one that does it is rewarded. Wa yu'aqabu tariquhu. And the one that leaves it off is punished. امْتِثَالًا لِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ When he does it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are other definitions that we, we will study in the Sul al-Fiqh inshallah. But this is the most simple definition. The easiest definition. So it's something that if a person does, they will be rewarded. As salah مثلا. If you pray, you will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you leave it off, you will be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last part, امْتِثَالًا لِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ Doing it for the sake of Allah. It has to obviously be something that you're doing for the sake of Allah. If a person fasts and they're doing it to lose weight, they won't be rewarded because they're not doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or if someone goes to hajj just for exercise, just for the sake of it, and just because he's got a four-week break, then obviously they won't be rewarded. Like if they do it for the sake of Allah jalla wa'ala, they will be rewarded. So that's the definition. Number two, or point number two. Wajib is of two types. Wajib is of two types. Fardu'ayn 
anfaqdu kifaya. The first is faqdu ain. Something which is anfaqdu ain means something which is wajib upon every single Muslim. Every single Muslim. مثلا توحيد الصلاة You can't say I'm not going to pray Maghrib today because my father prayed on my behalf today لا So um, uh, uh, واجب العيني or واجب العين is that which is واجب upon every single Muslim The second type فقد كفاية is that which is واجب obligatory upon the Muslims as a whole Upon the Muslim community as a whole. مثلا صلاة الجنازة. How to perform صلاة الجنازة. How to wash the deceased. Knowledge of the inheritance. Knowledge of inheritance and so on. Knowledge of بيوع, buying and selling and so on. If a person isn't a merchant himself. These things are wajib upon the Muslim ummah as a whole. For حفاظ القرآن. Someone to memorize the Quran. All of these are wajibat. They're wajib, but they're wajib as the, upon the Muslims as a whole. So if one part of the community perform it, then the responsibility and the burden is removed from everyone else. مثلا صلاة الجنازة Knowledge of how to pray and صلاة الجنازة itself. If someone passes away and ten people pray on him, pray on them, then the responsibility is lifted upon the rest of us. So wajib is how many types? The first, Fagdu Ain, and Fagdu Ain is what? Which is wajib upon every single individual. The second type, which is? Naam, communal obligation. Something that is wajib, wajib upon the whole of the Ummah or the community as a whole. As a whole. How can we differentiate between the two? How can we differentiate between what type of knowledge is wajib upon every single individual and what type of knowledge is wajib upon? Just think at the definition, look at the definition. طيب, excellent. Knowledge that you require for ibadah. That which your religion will be upright upon. That knowledge, which unless you know it, then you can't practice your religion. So, مثلا, you need to know what Tawheed is. If you don't know Tawheed, you're going to fall into shirk. So, learning Tawheed is فَقْدُ عَيْنُ أَوْ كِفَايَا فَقْدُ عَيْنُ It is wajib upon you as an individual. الصلاة Knowledge of how to pray. Is it wajib upon you as a, as, uh, as a Muslim or is it wajib upon the whole Ummah? It's, it's fagdu ayn. Why? Because you have to pray. Fasting, knowledge of how to fast and what breaks fast and so on. That is fagdu ayn. Why? Because fasting is wajib upon every single Muslim. طيب. What about inheritance? Someone who, someone passes away and we need to know who to give the money his inheritance to. Huh? Fagdu kifaya. Because if you don't know, you're not going to be sinning. You won't be sinning. So that is the difference between the two. That is the difference between the two. Wajib. Annahu yajibu alayna. Ta'allumu. To learn four issues. Al-ilm. You've already studied the benefits of knowledge, the virtues of knowledge uh, in the Quran and the Sunnah. Man salaka tariqan yaltamisu fiha and so on. So you already know the virtues of seeking knowledge. Like in knowledge is ma'rifatul haq. Ma'rifatul haqi bidalilihi. Knowing the truth with its evidence. That is what knowledge is. Ma'rifatul haq bidalilihi. Tayyip. Arba'i masail. So he says four issues. We take from there a benefit which is the shaykh is now going to say well, there's four issues that we need to learn. Then he's going to say there's three issues that we need to learn. The book itself is called what? Thalatatul Usul. In Nawaqad al-Islam, he mentions how many? Ten. 
in Qawa'ad al but he mentions how many? Four. 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 When you say to, when you're teaching a person and you say to them, we're going to learn six things today. They're more inclined to listening. They're going to listen to you. And they're going to, pay atten- uh, they're going to be paying a lot of attention. And they're going to make sure that they write all six points and try understanding them. Like if you say to them, we're going to learn a lot today. It means nothing to them because they don't know where the beginning is and where the ending is. Like when you say to them the first mas'ala, the first issue, and then you say after a while the third issue, the fourth issue, they know they've only got a few issues left. And when you get to the sixth issue, they know that you're going to stop at that point. That's why the scholars, they say the conditions of salah are nine and the pillars are 14 and the wajibat are eight and so on. So that the person can easily understand and he knows what to expect. So, مثلا, if someone asks you what the uh, conditions of salah are, and you know they're nine, you're going to say one, two, three, four, five. If you end up with five and you don't know anymore, then you know how many are missing? Four. Four. Like, and if you don't know the amount in the first place, you won't, you won't know how many are missing. And the Shaykh, rahimahullah ta'ala, rahmatan wa sa'a, he does that a lot. Al-Ula, the very first thing, the very first thing he says, Al-Ilmu. Al-ilmu wa huwa ma'rifatullah The very first thing is knowledge And it is ma'rifatullah wa ma'rifatun nabiyyihi wa ma'rifatun deen al-islam bil adillah So the very first thing is knowledge That you have knowledge, that you learn If a person doesn't have knowledge They can worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 60 years, 50 years In the wrong way A man came into the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's masjid and he prayed. Then he came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, Salam alaikum. The Messenger said, Wa alaikum salam. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then said to him, Irji' fa salli fa innaka lam tusalli. Go and pray, for verily you haven't prayed. The man went back and he came back to him. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him again, Irji' fa salli. Go back, you haven't prayed. Go back and pray, for verily you haven't prayed. On the third go, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the same thing to him. And he said, teach me. The man said, teach me. Very I don't know anything better than that. So this man, he was praying salah. Like it wasn't called the salah. The messenger said, فَإِنَّكَ لَمْ تُصَلِّ Very you haven't prayed. So if you try worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon ignorance, then you may end up with your ibadah not getting accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You may not even... يعني, the wajib may still be upon you مثلا, Hajj is wajib upon us right? At least once in a lifetime Imagine if a person goes to Hajj And they get to Mecca On the 10th of On the 10th of um, Muharram uh, On the 10th of the Hijjah On Eid day And then they do Tawaf around the Kaaba And then they go to Mina And they spend 3 days in Mina And so on And they do the Jamarat is there Hajj accepted, Abdullah? No. Yeah, why not? The Hajj period is finished. They could have spent thousands and they could have done Tawaf around the Kaaba when there were millions of people in the Masjid. And they could have gone back to Mina, the tent city, and stayed there and so on. Like, they haven't performed Hajj. Why? Because Hajj starts on the eighth day. And the most important pillar is what? Yom Haga for the ninth day. If they miss that, there's no Hajj for them. If a person says Allahu Akbar and they never read the Fatiha, then their salah hasn't even started yet. Therefore, it's important that you know. The Shaykh says, Rahimahullah, and that knowledge is knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and knowing Al Islam. Knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lakin, it is not just knowing, it is a knowing that has actions, that comes with. Actions and the Sheikh shall say in the second point, Al Amalu bi the fact that now you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and now you know the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and now that you know Islam, then act according to that which it, it necessitates. So Mathana, now that you know Allah Jalla wa ala is the one that has to, the right to be worshipped. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala com- uh, there's commandments and there's prohibitions. The second step is to implement that. And there are ways to see, to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are signs, universal signs and 
signs from the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is to come in the ta'ala. Likewise, knowing the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, knowing that he is a messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's the last messenger and that we have to follow his sunnah and we have to believe in everything that he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we have to know that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how he worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we abstain and we stay away from that which he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stayed away from Allah jalla wa ala says فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Verily they will not have complete iman until they make you, O Muhammad, the judge in that which they differ over, over, uh, in be- between themselves over. So we have to go to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for everything. That is what knowing the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is. And it is not just knowing for the sake of knowing. Because the Jews, they knew the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Exactly how they knew their own children. They knew that the Messenger وسلم, was going to come. They knew it was the time for a Prophet to come. Like him, because he wasn't from them, they rejected his message. And look at the uncle of the Messenger وسلم, Abu Talib. He knew that the deen of Muhammad وسلم, was the correct deen. Lakin, he did not accept the deen of the Messenger, the religion of the Prophet. Also, wa ma'rifatu deen al Islam. And knowing the religion of Islam. Knowing the religion of Islam. And Islam, there's a general meaning for Islam and there's a specific meaning for Islam. So write this down. A general meaning for Islam and a specific meaning of an Islam. The general meaning of Islam is the religion of all of the prophets. Every messenger said to his people, Ya qawm, Allah ma lakum min ilahin ghayru. Oh, oh my people, worship Allah. You have no Lord other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from them Ibrahim, would make dua to Allah jalla wa ala, Rabbana waj'alna muslimayni laka wa min dhuriyatina ummatan muslimatan lak. Allah is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make him and his offspring Muslims. So all of the Anbiya, they were calling to Islam. They called to the general Islam of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every nation that had the messenger sent to them and accepted that call they were Muslims, the followers of Ibrahim, the followers of Musa, the followers of Isa alayhim salam. They were all Muslims because they accepted Islam. Then there's the specific meaning of Al-Islam. And the specific meaning of Al-Islam is the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The religion or the sharia that was sent, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent with, where Allah says, inna deen inda Allah al-Islam. Verily the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-Islam. وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِي غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ هُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Whoever takes a religion or seeks a religion other than Islam, then it will not be accepted from him. And in the Akhirah, he is from the losers. It is also the specific meaning of Islam is the religion that Allah Jalla wa'ala says اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتمت عليكم نعمة ورديت لكم الإسلام دينا This day I have completed my favor upon you and chosen Islam as your religion. This day I've completed the religion for you. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتمت عليكم نعمة and completed my favor upon you. وغديت لكم الإسلام دينا and I'm pleased for you to have Islam as your religion. Also, the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم saw Umar رضي الله عنه with a part of the 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 Torah. And he said to him صلى الله عليه وسلم, verily there is not a Yahudi and a Nasrani except that it is wajib that they follow. The Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, every, so after the time of the Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, after the sending of the Prophet, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, every other religion has been abrogated. Every other Sharia of all of the previous messengers has been abrogated of Islam. So we can only follow the religion 
or abrogated with the Sharia of the Prophet وسلم, with the religion of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bil adilla with evidence with evidence so the Sheikh says it's not enough that you know like you have to know with evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah and he's and pondering over the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala طيب. that's the first one Athania, so we've got about five minutes left طيب. طيب. We'll, end up, we'll stop there inshallah we'll stop on the second point Al-amal bihi. we'll stop there inshallah and we'll continue next lesson um, we can have questions and so on and if anyone has any questions over the exam and so on Wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa ahkamu billahi tawfiq